Day 892 of the Ukrainian war map, also known as the Russo-Ukrainian war. Juzzy here, and today is another update as I take a simplified and down-to-earth approach to some of the most important happenings on the ground in Ukraine. So starting off, we'll take a look at those Russian losses, as currently Russia sits on more than 582,000 military personnel losses, representing an additional 1,150 in the past day. Then as for hardware losses, 5 tanks, 17 APVs, 59 artillery, plus three MLRS systems and three air defense systems, which we'll take a look at some of in just a moment. Then headed to the map as over the weekend, Ukrainian forces conducted a significant attack on Russian military installations in the Rostov region. The primary attack was the Morozovsk airfield, a base for Russian Su-34 jets used in frontline sortie efforts against Ukrainian personnel. The Ukrainian general staff reported successful strikes on ammunition warehouses, including those storing aviation equipment utilized by those jets. Satellite imagery and fire tracking systems confirmed extensive damage to the airfield, particularly in the northeastern ammunition storage area. Massive secondary explosions were observed, with very, very recent updates from the Russian Z bloggers reporting on the results of a drone strike on the airfield, stating that an Su-34 jet and a warehouse with aircraft armaments were both destroyed. Plus, a flight control center was hit, and further airfield engineering equipment was damaged as well. So this attack is part of an ongoing series of Ukrainian strikes on the Morozovsk airfield with previous operations in June, then again in April this year where it damaged or destroyed a staggering and I believe record breaking six jets in a single attack. Then adjacent to this and simultaneously, Ukrainian drones targeted an oil depot in the Kamensky district of the Rostov region as well, which is in fact directly east of the airfield and closer to the Ukrainian border. At least two oil tanks were hit and caught fire at the Atlas storage facility. This facility reportedly supplied Russian military units in occupied Donetsk and Luhansk regions, with this attack reportedly involving approximately 15 obsidian drones, which sounds like a new and different type of drone that we don't have much, if any, real details on. Though, it could be one of the unmanned UAVs in the following chart here, potentially one of the stealthy jet-propelled variants. And given the stated obsidian name, which is a, in fact, a naturally occurring volcanic glass formed when lava from a volcano cools rapidly. So I'm guessing the payload of these drones spread a lot of shrapnel of a possible molten metal construction. But ultimately, as for this event, these actions represent a continuation of Ukraine's strategy to disrupt Russian military logistics and fuel supplies behind enemy lines. Then headed way down the map as Ukraine's military reported successful targeting on Russian-occupied Crimea, resulting in the striking of a Russian Black Sea Fleet's submarine and damage to an S-400 air defense system or complex. Now, as for this Kilo-class submarine, the Rostov-on-Don was reportedly sunk in the port of Sevastopol, which is all very interesting, as this vessel, capable of launching caliber cruise missiles, had previously sustained significant damage almost a year ago, when it was sitting on the dry docks, only to be struck by two Storm Shadow missiles. And as such, was undergoing repairs for the past 11 months, and then most recently moved out of the dry docks and was afloat in the wet docks right at the time it was targeted. Now, this originally price-tagged $300 million submarine has clearly had a large amount of resources spent on it, from manpower and time spent to the sheer cost to repair such an incredible level of the former damage that it received. And as of now, some reports go as far as to even state that the submarine has outright sank, with no chance of being salvaged, going to join the rest of the Russian fleet that's sitting at the bottom of the Black Sea. But only time will tell to what level of destruction has happened in this case, noting that Russia only has three other submarines operational or potentially capable of being operational, because they don't currently seem to do a lot hiding at the other end of the Black Sea. 
Then, as part of a second parter to this region, so additionally within Crimea, four launches of Russia's S-400 air defense system were reported to be significantly damaged over the weekend. While the Russian Defense Ministry has not commented on these claims, burn marks have been observed at the S-400 Triumph position on the Kayabash Heights in Balaclava, according to satellite imagery. And just to note, that word, Triumph, being the name Russia has given to this air defense system, the S-400, a name which becomes more and more ironic with each and every passing month. Then, also over the weekend, and still within Russia, a drone attack reportedly struck an oil depot in Russia's Belgorod Oblast. As stated by the region's governor, the attack occurred in the Gubginsky district, which is more so at the far end of the oblast, away from the country's border. And the incident has resulted in an explosion and a fire in one of the tanks. Then headed across into Ukraine, as there's been a bit of recent activity from the AFU in the Zaporizhia oblast, as... Well, take for instance, a Ukrainian Air Force MiG-29 Fulcrum struck a Russian-occupied building, leaving the structure obliterated, all by use of a French-supplied AASM hammer-guided munition. And then we saw the case of a Ukrainian FPV munition flying into a loaded Russian TOS-1A thermobaric MRL, so multiple rocket launcher, still in the Zaporizhia region, causing a catastrophic ammunition detonation that effectively disintegrated the Russian launcher. And so all of this appears to relate to increased Russian activity on the southern front as Ukrainian forces reported renewed Russian attacks on the Hule Polar front in the Zaporizhia oblast after quite a long pause now. Meanwhile, Petro Andrushenko, an advisor to Mariupol's exiled mayor, reported a significant increase in the transport of Russian military equipment through occupied Mariupol towards Zaporizhia, which is something that we generally already know about, although this latest movement includes tracked vehicles and new markings on equipment. Russian forces are also using disguised civilian trucks to transport troops, in fact using quote-unquote false civilian 20-ton white trucks to transport manpower, which is the first time something like this has been seen during the occupation. Though it's entirely plausible that Russian military logistics is just frighteningly incapable, leading the army to weigh heavily into acquiring civilian transport means, which we tend to see a lot of anyway. But as for the swiping of civilian logistics trucks, can you imagine the economies of those Russian-occupied zones just completely destroyed by the Russian military on all levels, with thieving all over the place like kids in a candy store? Then taking a look around further on the map, as the Ukrainian unit known as the Grom Team destroyed a Russian BM-21 Grad multiple rocket launcher in the forest of the Aleshsky district in Kherson right there on the south bank. Then we saw the most classic case of fireworks spitting out of a Russian book air defense system. And with events like these, at some stage, Russia is going to have such a limited capacity to defend their Ukrainian and own border airspace that all they will be able to do is pull back their remaining air defense systems to defend the capital and Putin himself. And it's not going to be a pretty situation either. Then, also in the east, a bit of a different case here. So, the FPV drone attack on a Russian UAV from the perspective of the Russian reconnaissance drone. So, the last thing the Russian drone saw was the AFU quadcopter coming up by its left side before the feed cut out, due to, no doubt, from the Ukrainian drone setting off its payload. Then also, something a little bit unique as well as... Well, move over Russian tanks, because we saw the case of a Russian Turtle IFV, infantry fighting vehicle this time, a BMP-3, which was destroyed by an FPV drone. This is quite a rare combination, potentially suggesting the Russian units in question didn't have access to a tank to box itself in with. Then lastly to show, we saw another case of a cemetery of Russian bikes after they attacked the positions of, or should I say, attempted to attack the positions of the Ukrainian 58th Brigade, 
Now, motorbikes have almost always been a support tool in the history of warfare, and their usage in direct assault roles was almost non-existent 50 or 100 years ago even. And what didn't work back then definitely doesn't work any better now. Then with my need to cap a slight limit on today's video, I'll head straight across to a fairly quick Russian military mobilization blunder segment. So in this one, we see Russian soldiers fill cups with puddle water amid ongoing critical water shortages that they face. Gee, enjoy the dysentery or dysentery outbreak on the horizon. And sometimes I'm just numb from seeing so many things like this, and at other times I see this as such a scathing indictment of the Russian army's failure to provide basic necessities for its troops. It's actually some pretty thoughtless and disgusting treatment by the Russian MOD and from the Russian Emperor on top, and is truly a byproduct, consequence, or symptom of such a systemically corrupt society. Then to some lighter news to take the edge off a bit as Ukraine's women's sabre fencing team secured the country's first gold medal at the Paris Olympics, defeating South Korea in the final with a score of 45 to 42. Their journey to gold included victories over Italy in the quarterfinals and Japan in the semifinals. The final against South Korea was a closely contested match with the Ukrainian team emerging victorious. And this gold medal has particular significance for teammate Olga Karlin, as it makes her Ukraine's most decorated Olympian in history, with a total of six medals. Then headed across to a quick funny to round it all off for today guys, so the Russian National Football League, or the RPL, which I'll add quickly is a soccer league just to avoid any international confusion there, created the Russian ZOV football club to increase the level of patriotism within the Russian Federation recently. And firstly to note, which you might already be aware, the letters ZOV are Russian pro-war symbols, which resembles the, the word ZOB, which means call forth to war, call forth to arms, making for a very cringeworthy name for a team, and a very forceful addition of a team as well. And so most recently, the ZOV team, in a case of a bad omen, was immediately eliminated from the National Cup in the first match. Then to add insult to injury, the goal against them was scored by a midfielder named Koklov. Which is very ironic because it sounds very similar to Kokol, which is a derogatory or belittling word or term used by the Russian military to refer to Ukrainians. So you couldn't even make all of this stuff up. And yet ironic twists of fate like these continue to happen to Russia. Oddly impressive. So that's it for today guys. Thanks again for watching. Please continue to like and I definitely hope to see all of you guys there in the next one. Cheers.